Father, we thank you for your great love and your mercy towards us. We thank you that even though it's wet, blowing and rainy outside, we're comfortable in here. We pray that you will guide us. We need to know the truth as it is in Jesus. We don't need to know what churches teach. We don't need to know what men think. We don't need to know what theologians have put together. We want to know what's in your heart and in your mind. We want to believe what you believe. Help us. We're not equipped to understand your thoughts until you bring them to us. Bless us today. You make all of our appointments. May your name be honored in Jesus' precious name. I think uh, we are about on page 477. The desire of eight. No. I'm thinking too many thoughts there. 677. That's where we are. Okay. Let me find it quickly here. Okay. I believe we ended with the thought... He does not bid the disciples labor to bear fruit. So Jesus doesn't bid us to work ourselves up, to go out there and start beating on doors to prove that we're bearing fruit. (laughs) That's not the way it works. If we have Jesus in us, we're going to bear fruit. So the whole idea is not to go and start beating on doors to prove to yourself you've got it. Be sure you have Jesus, then the rest comes. Okay? That's our work. Remember when Jesus was talking to the disciples? He was telling them, Don't set yourself up to do things yourself. You can only do things in me. And there's only one way he could do that. That was for them to have his spirit. Now, we don't get His Spirit so that we can do things. We receive His Spirit, and then we do things. (laughs) Okay? We can't program this. We can't make it work. That's a Christianity that we are forming. That's not anything God is doing. We must do things His way. And He has made it very simple to follow Him if we will have Him as the power. Now, I'm, I want to read the next little sentence here. The words of Christ are spirit and life. Receiving them, you receive the life of the vine. So there's only one way to get grafted to that vine and to receive His life. And she just gave us a secret here. The words of Christ are, what was the first word she said? Spirit and life. What was the first word? Spirit. Spirit. Now we run by past that. What spirit is she talking about? His spirit. He himself. She is not talking about another one. She is talking about... The Spirit of Jesus is Spirit and life. That's the Spirit we need. It's the only one the Bible talks about. There is salvation in no other name. So notice what she says next. You live by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Why did she use that scripture? They took it out of the NIV. They took it out of the NASB. They took it out of every modern version. Luke 4, 4 is gone. But you'll notice it's here. Because she says, you must not remove one word from the Word of God. Not one word! Well, I think we need to educate some of our people about that. We should not be using Bibles where they have removed entire verses. At least, and call them the Word of God. We can use them as references because there are other verses that they have done for work with. We can use them as reference works, but we must not call them the Word of God.
Okay, so notice what she does next. The life of Christ in you produces the same fruits as in Him, living in Christ, adhering to Christ, supported by Christ, drawing nourishment from Christ, you bear fruit after the similitude of Christ. Now tell me, spirit and life, what was the name she kept using where we get it? She never falters. And you will never find her faltering in all of her writings. We receive these always from Jesus Christ. Now, since he can't be with us in person, he's got to have a way of doing all this for us all the time without him being there. What's that way? It's simple, isn't it? It's his spirit that comes to us. It's he himself in his spirit. The problem is the word spirit in the Greek and in the Hebrew Ruach and Numa gives us the idea of a ghost. And that's what somebody gave us, those ideas. We did not invent that. We didn't think it up. Somebody gave it to us. We believed it and we kept it. But the word spirit is, is not telling us about a ghost in the Bible. The word spirit is telling us about the thought of God himself. His mind coming to us. His influence coming to our mind. That's His Spirit. Okay? So, His thoughts can be in us. His body can't be in us. But His thoughts and His mind and His influence can be in us all the time. And we have the Spirit of God. See? And in order to do that, you don't need another person. You had Jesus himself. Okay? So, we want to keep, keep this together. The Bible is telling us about the mind of God. And we will read spirit prophecy on that before we're done here. Alright, so continuing. He saw that new ideas and impulses must control them. New what? Ideas. Right there. That's where he's aiming at. His spirit, his mind, his thoughts. He wants them to become our thoughts. Our impulses. So we have the same way of thinking. That's what the spirit is for. It's about our mind. That's what the spirit does. Okay, continuing. Through his life, uh, sorry. He saw that new ideas and impulses must control them, that new principles must be practiced by them. Through his life and death, they were to receive a new conception of love. Now, when he told them, a new commandment I give you, love each other as I have loved you. How could they have known what he was saying at that moment? He hadn't died yet. They could not understand what he was saying until he died. Then they could say, that's how he loves. To death he died for us. That's how he wants us to love other people. See? He wants us to love everybody else to death. So Jesus... It's telling us here, if you get my life, my spirit, you get my ideas, when you get what you, God wants to give you, my Father wants to give you, you will receive the desire to save people so much that you are willing to die for them to get it done. And this is what Jesus means by self-denial. There is no Christianity without self-denial. A person who's self-gratifying all the time is not a Christian. Okay? It's simple. Because a Christian doesn't live for self. A Christian lives to save other people, no matter what it costs. And that's why we have these meetings. We're trying to get to the mind of Jesus. We're trying to get to His Spirit. 
But we can't get there if we believe corrupt theology. We can't do it. You can't get to the real gospel if you believe a lie. No one can do it. So we have the high privilege of the, having the spirit of prophecy so we can believe it. Because the spirit of prophecy is the spirit of Jesus. It's his thoughts through Alan White to get to our thoughts. The command to love one another had a new meaning in the light of his self-sacrifice. The whole work of grace is one continual service of love, of self-denying, self-sacrificing effort. Now that's been in our books the whole time. <laughs> That is what Christianity is. There is no other kind of Christianity. We must have the divine life, the Spirit of God, through His Son, in us, so that we can live the same way He lives. And the only way He knows how to live is self-sacrificing love. During every hour of Christ's sojourn upon the earth, the love of God... The Father was flowing from Him in irrepressible streams. All who are imbued with His Spirit will love as He loved. Now, if you get rid of this idea that every time it says Spirit, it's talking about another being, another God, and start leaving it where it belongs. Jesus, His Spirit that He got from His Father, everything works. And once you see it working, you will understand how it can work in you. Because it's simple. From the Father to the Son to me. That is simple. It's, there are no complications. Uh, she then talks about uh, the love that Jesus is talking about. When that love comes into the church, <coughs> we will not be arguing with each other anymore. We will not be ha having theological issues anymore. We will love each other because we all have the same spirit teaching us how we can have the same mind, the same thoughts, the same ideas. We will have harmony with one another. We will have unity. That's what the 17th chapter is about, isn't it? That's where he's headed. That's where he's going. He says, I am leaving you in chapter 14. They got all sad. He says, no, you don't need to get sad because if I'm leaving you, I'm going to the Father. My Father. God, Jesus has a Father. <laughs> I'm going to my Father, but I'll come back again. He says, I will do whatever you ask in my name. Who's going to do it? He didn't say a representative. He said, I will do it. I am the comforter. I am the spirit of truth. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you again. In the 15th chapter, he says, I am the vine. You are the branches. We are connected. You're going to do the work now on this earth because I am in heaven with the Father. You're going to do it on the earth in the spirit of the Father and the Son. So he's told us he's divine. It's not another person. He is divine. He is the one controlling the work on this earth. Jesus himself. We all know that when we are missionaries doing our work, there's somebody with us helping us. Strengthening us all the time. And it's not just an angel. Who is that somebody? It's Jesus. Now how can we say Jesus is with me every day? He's walking with me. He's giving me strength. He's giving me power. He's giving me... How can we say that and then say, but it's not him. It's somebody else. What kind of sense does that make? But people have told us things that are absolute nonsense. And we believe them because we trust them. Absolute nonsense. But none of the pioneers believed any of that. And do you know what they say about the pioneers? 
I can show it to you at the BRI, Bible Research. I can show it to you at the White Estate. I can show it to you at the General Conference. They all say the same thing. The pioneers were wrong. That's right. You go online. You read it yourself on the web from the leadership of the church today. The pioneers were wrong. And they go so far as to say, as they grew and as they developed and as they learned, they changed their minds. And they even say, Ellen White changed her mind. There is something horribly wrong with that process. I'm sorry, Ellen White was not an evolutionist. And neither were the pioneers. Who were they taught by? The Spirit of Jesus. How could they be wrong? How could they be wrong? Okay, I have a note. Maybe I better slow down here and read the notes. True religion is knowing and doing the will of God in accordance with... I can read the word. Word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Okay, every, every, every word. Okay, that's right. Now, the devil hates Luke 4.4, 4, so he took it out of the modern versions. Yeah. I'm sorry to have to say that, but who else would do it? All right, I have another note here. Why would Ellen White ask us to reprint the pioneers' writings? Yeah, why? If they were wrong, why did you say a thing like that? Thank you, thank you. Okay, I have another one. In Desire of Ages, page 671, referring to the person. You said person means personality. Can you show us in the dictionary, no Webster, where it says so, and then the definition of Godhead? Well, let's see. Oh, you have it. Look up Godhead. Yeah, just look up Godhead and we'll do it. Excellent. Excellent. That's a good question. While he's doing that, it occurs to me that if we're going to deal with specific scripture or spirit of prophecy, we need to understand a little bit of history. Because one of the problems of being a Seventh-day Adventist, we all came in after we were educated by somebody. That's the first problem. We were learning from somebody that we trusted knew what they were talking about. Okay. Now, in all fairness, they thought they did. <laughs> they would not try to deceive you. They were probably very faithful church members who were doing the best they could, giving you what they were told. When we became members, they did something to you that I don't think is in the Bible. I used to do it as a pastor, and I never thought about it. I just did what everybody does all the time. Here's the baptismal certificate. Do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in God the Son? Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? And the rest of it's downhill because you just did the three no-no's. Where in the Bible does it say we're supposed to make people check off what they believe before we can baptize them? Where does it say you have to believe 28 things or you cannot be a member of this church? Where does it say you're supposed to have a creed? Where does it say anywhere in the Bible you all have to believe the same thing or you can't sit in our chairs? You see, we took a jump someplace. So now let me go do the history here. Listen very carefully because I want to try to deal with the good questions that our brother has brought us here. In the great controversy, on page 50, I want to read you something that I'm afraid has been horribly overlooked. Great controversy, page 50. It begins on the, the last sentence of 49. The nominal conversion of Constantine. Now, do we all know who Constantine is? He was a heathen Roman emperor who wanted to unify the empire. He did not care anything about religion. He didn't care about anything at all except getting everybody together. 
And so he figured, you know, we have all these factions. I've got to figure out a way to get them to all be one. We're going to have one religion here. And it's either going to be they all worship Caesar or they all worship whatever they want to worship. But we're all going to do it at the same time, the same way. Well, he was out there fighting and they saw a cross and he says, well, if we win this, we'll join that religion. And they won the battle. He says, that's it. We're all going to be Christians. We will all be Christians now in the empire. He says, and I'll be one too. What kind of a conversion is that? Has nothing to do with Jesus. Has nothing to do with anything. He just figured we will unify the whole empire. We will all be Christians now. I'm going to baptize all of my soldiers. They're all going to be Christians. We're going to have one religion. Which religion will it be? Because Christianity is divided. Well, we, we have the ones in the east. And we have the ones in the west. We're going to work this out. Constantine, in the early part of the 4th century, what is the 4th cent century in numbers? 300. 300s, okay. Now we know what happened in 321. That's where he got the churches to give up the Sabbath and keep Sunday by Roman law. So she says in the 4th century... It caused great rejoicing. To who? Constantine. <laughs> it caused great rejoicing to Constantine because he got everybody together. We're not going to be Jews anymore. We're going to be Christians. We'll keep Sunday. And the world, cloaked with a form of righteousness, walked into the church. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. In the fourth century in the 300s the world walked into the church and this does not mean the Catholic Church because they're not up yet you see we have believed the uh, Protestant lie that the Catholics go back to Peter <laughs> they're not here yet it's the Eastern Church and the Western Church okay it has not been decided who's going to be top dog yet who's the world the world walked into the church. Who's the world? The world is the synagogue of Satan. Because whoever is not a Christian belongs to Satan. Simple. The world walked into the Christian church. Now, the work of corruption rapidly progressed. So the church is now going to be corrupted. That's what I'm trying to get us to, to begin this little review of history. That corruption began in the 300s. The first thing we see is the Sabbath has been changed to Sunday by the Roman Empire. Paganism, while appearing to be vanquished, became the conqueror. So paganism is coming to the church. All you have to do is go back to the 300s and notice something. The next thing that Constantine did in 325 was call a council of the church. And the scholars, including our own, teach that was the first general conference. Well, I'm sorry. Who called it? Constantine. He hasn't got a right to call a council, especially a Christian one. Well, the thing that our own people do that, that's not really historical is we say that's where the Catholic Church took over. Now, I'm sorry. The Eastern Church came to that council. There were only eight representatives from the Western Church uh, out of 380. So we're, we're putting the blame in the wrong places. We can't say historically the Catholic Church did something at that council because they weren't really there. Okay, we better study our history. The pagans were there, and the Eastern Church was there. Eusebius of Caesarea was there. Arius was there. 
The one that said Jesus is a created being. And Athanasius was there, a real hothead. That he's the one who's going to fight Arius. So we've got all of this coming together. The corruption is starting in the Christian church. Arius says Jesus is a created being. Athanasius says, no, it's a trinity. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. In the 300s, the word trinity comes out. Where did he get that? He got it from Tertullian. Tertullian is the first one in all history in Christianity to use the word trinity. The apostles never used it because they didn't believe in it. Jesus never used it because he didn't believe in it. Tertullian made it up and brought it into the Christian church. Origin was before him. Do you know who Origin is? Yeah. Origin the heretic. He changed the Greek Apostles' Bible and made his own, which became the Catholic version, which became the modern versions. All right. Now, I want to remind you now, so far we have Sunday in the 300s. We have the immortality of the soul. That comes at this time. We have salvation that either comes by being saved in your sins or by your works. Okay? Now, I don't know if you've analyzed that yet, but being saved in your sins means you believe justification is all there is. After that, you don't need to worry. You don't need to worry about your sins because you're justified by faith. I have righteousness by faith. I'm going to heaven. It doesn't matter if I really am converted. Saved by your works? What is that? You don't trust Jesus. You're going to get better and better until you get good enough. I hope we don't have a taste of both of those in our church. And at this time, Constantine said, we must have one book, one Bible for all Christians. We can't have all these different things floating around. We're going to have one book. Eusebius, I want you to make me 50 Bibles. We will distribute these and Christianity will have one Bible. And so they did. Today, we only know about two of them that survived. They're called Ale, uh, uh, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. Those are the two of those 50 that still survive today. Those are Bibles made by Eusebius, who was a disciple of origin, who used the corrupt Greek and brought them into the Christian church. Ellen White says the world walked into the church. They brought those Bibles with them. The synagogue of Satan has Bibles that belong to them. By the way, Origen made his Greek translation because he said the apostolic Bibles were inferior. It's the same thing the scholars say today. That King James Version is inferior because it comes from bad texts. You can read that on the General Conference line because that's what they teach today from General Conference. Erasmus was inferior. That's in the online also. Does Ellen White ever say that? On page 245 of Great Controversy, she says, Erasmus corrected many of the errors of the Vulgate. Now remember, we're just doing a little brief history here because we want to get to something so we can just discuss good questions. This system, and I want you to recognize something now, once a system is established, Everything you believe and teach in that system has to match that system. If it's a system of the devil, everything in that system comes from the devil. If you have the system of God, everything in that system is the truth. You can't mix them up. So now, we are looking historically at the system the devil created. And it came out the Roman Catholic Church. It came out the papacy. Okay? The masterpiece of Satan is what Ellen White calls it. 
She says Protestants used to abhor puffery. Does anybody abhor it today? Does anybody in the Adventist church abhor it today? Do we say, no way, we don't want anything that they came up with. They shun it. That's what the Spirit of Prophecy says. They shun and abhor puffery. Well, the Protestants did not shun and abhor puffery because what they came up with was a misunderstanding of the judgment. They understand it the same way that the Catholic Church does. They came up with misunderstanding the 2300 days. They believe it the same way the Catholics do. They misunderstood who the Antichrist is. The Protestants believe it the same way as the Catholics do. Now the unfortunate thing about all this, we, we are making a list here of everything that Constantine started. I'm not going to tag on the last one on the list. The Trinity. This is where the Trinity happened in the Christian church. The Council of Nicaea. It came through origin. It came through Arius fighting with Athanasius. This brief history, we're only up to the 4th century. We could keep following this all the way through. But this is enough to get it started. Ellen White says this is where the corruptions came into the Christian church. I'm going to jump now to 1915. What happened in 1915? The prophet died. Up until then, this church believed the Bible truth. We believed the 2300 days, just the way the Bible teaches it. We believe the judgment, just the way the Bible teaches it. We believe the Sabbath, just the way the Bible teaches it. We believe, we know what Seventh-day Adventists believe or should believe. But in 1915, the prophet was gone. Now something you may not be aware of is that Willie White, up until that point, had had a purpose in life. It was to be with his mother and back her up, to help her. When Ellen White died, it was like Willie White died because they stopped paying attention to him. They completely ignored him until 1919. They forgot he existed and he had no purpose because what the brethren decided was we're going to lock up the writings of Ellen G. White. Her work is over. No, she did not have to do. The brethren decided we're going to seal her writings in a vault, lock them up, and never look at them again. Well, in 1919, they had a Bible conference. And we wouldn't know about that except they found those writings much later. And somebody thought about inviting Willie White to that conference. But it wasn't until after they had sent out the invitations and his name wasn't on the list. <laughs> but they figured out since he belonged in the general conference level, they ought to invite him too. So they invited him. He came and he talked a little bit about his mother and the prophetic gift and so forth. What God was trying to say the spirit of prophecy in our church. He had a son, Arthur White. And when Willie White died, Arthur White took over. But they ignored him too for a while. Until the Second World War, and then finally they, they thought, you know, we ought to preserve some of this stuff. And they invited him to come to Washington, and they moved the, the materials, and they put them all in Washington. And little by little, the White Estate was established. But I want to go back to 1930. In 1930, in the month of March, the General Conference Committee, I did not say the General Conference. I said the committee, which Alan White in 1901 said has no power. Yeah, in 1901 she said that to the General Conference, these committees mean nothing. Only the General Conference in session is the voice of God. But in 1930, somebody made a four-member committee and said, you write down what we believe, fundamental beliefs, 
But only one person did it. Just one person wrote those. His name was Wilcox, F.M. Wilcox. So they didn't even have a committee. It was one man. And F.M. Wilcox said, we believe in the Trinity. Something Ellen White didn't believe in and something none of the pioneers believed in. Something that's not in the Bible, something that Seventh-day Adventists have never believed up until this time. I'm going to read you something. It's the fundamental principles of 1872. The fundamental principles were written down by James White. And here's what he said. In presenting to the public this synopsis of our faith, we wish to have it distinctly understood that we have no articles of faith, creed, or discipline. We don't have 28 things we teach our people they have to believe in. We don't have that. We have no baptismal certificate. We have no, okay? He has just said it. We have none of this aside from the Bible. And he did not say, you choose your own. The Bible, and they all knew what that was. We do not put forth this as having any authority with our people. This has nothing to do with them becoming Seventh-day Adventists. We don't hang this over their head and say, you have to believe this or else. These were Christians. Nor is it designed to secure uniformly among them a system of faith. The pioneers did not have a system of faith that you had to say, I believe that before they baptize you. But it's a brief statement of what is and has been with great unanimity held by them. What does that mean? Everybody believed the same thing. They believed in the Sabbath. They believed in Jesus is the only salvation. They believed in the non-immortality of the soul. They believed. They all believed the same. So let me read what he says now about God. This is what all the Seventh-day Adventists in James White's day believed. That there is one God. A personal, spiritual being, the creator of all things, omnipotent, omniscient, and eternal, infinite in wisdom, holiness, justice, goodness, truth, and mercy, unchangeable, and everywhere present by his representative, the Holy Spirit. Now does that say there's another God? I don't think so. He said there's only one God. And he's everywhere by the Spirit, his Spirit. Number two, that there was one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Eternal Father. Now that's enough to start a war right there. The Son! The one by whom God created all things. The one, I thought it was Jesus and the Spirit together. No, that's not what the pioneers taught and believed, and neither did Ellen White. And by whom they do consist, that he took on him the nature of the seed of Abraham for the redemption of our fallen race, that he dwelt among men full of grace and truth, lived our example, died our sacrifice, was raised for our justification, ascended on high to be our only mediator in the sanctuary in heaven, where with his own blood he makes atonement for our sins, which atonement so far from being made on the cross, which was but the offering of the sacrifice, is the very last portion of his work as priest, according to the example of the Levitical priesthood. So, that the scriptures of the Old and New Testament were given by inspiration of God, and they go on. Not one word about a third God. And he said this is what all Seventh-day Adventists believe. Well, if you put this in front of people today, they'd say, what's that? Who believes that? In 1930 and 31, they changed all of this and said, we believe in the Trinity. The committee, not a general conference in session. And the committee was one man. And it was never voted by anyone. There is nothing official about it because it was one man's work and nobody said, okay, nobody. 
We're just doing a little bit of history here because we cannot understand where this Trinity came from until we understand what a Seventh-day Adventist used to look like. In 1931, in 1931, Wilkinson was not amused. Benjamin Wilkinson. He saw it. He said, what are you people doing? What's going on here? Because they voted in 1930. The Seventh-day Adventists don't need to use the inferior King James Version. They can use any new version they want. Seventh-day Adventists are free to use all versions. They are all equally the, the Word of God. That was not voted by a general conference in session. That was voted by a little group of four men. And Froome was involved in all of this. We are not going to study the history of Froome. What a rascal. Froome's work was taken up by Desmond Ford. Okay, I don't want to get into that side. We want to keep this history brief here. This is very important. The issue, of course, with Wilkinson was not the third person of the Godhead. He saw that coming too, but he focused in one place. He said, what do you mean taking the King James and making it inferior? What do you mean inferior? It's the Bible of the Reformation. He said, it's the Bible of the Spirit of Prophecy. Haven't you read Great Controversy? She says it's the Bible of the last days. She says, and she, he goes on talking about the Bible, the Bible. He said, have you, have you given up the spirit of prophecy? He asked the general conference people that. Have you given up the spirit of prophecy? In 1981, I was at that general conference session. Without any com committee work or anything like that, they just put together all these lists of doctrines. They put it in front of the delegates and said, this is what we believe. Yes, yes. We believe in one God, a unity of three persons, the Trinity. Now, I don't know how anybody can make sense out of three people becoming one. I don't know how you do that. My mind can't get around it. You know what the, what the seminary says, how you deal with that? It's a divine mystery, brother. You have to believe it by faith. I don't have that kind of faith. To make three things mean one. There's either one or there's three. You can't make those three into one. I have four documents in my computer from the Bible Research Institute where they all tell why we believe in the Trinity. They make very interesting reading. Horrible reading, but very interesting. The weird statements that are made to make nonsense into something that's supposed to be, make sense. I have two statements by Arthur White. And he does the same thing. He may be the grandson of a prophet, but he's certainly not a prophet. They use all the arguments that you will hear anybody making in leadership today in this church because that's where they got them from, from headquarters. I have Raul Dederin's work. I took classes from him and I took classes from Arthur Maxwell. Uh, not Maxwell, Arthur White. So I know that their writings represent what they really taught and believed. I would like to give you something to work with here. Review and Herald, March 25th. Review and Herald, May 25th, excuse me. May 25th, 1905. God has given me light regarding our periodicals. What is it? He has said that the dead are to speak. How? We are to repeat the words of the pioneers in our work who knew what it cost to search for the truth as for a hidden treasure. They moved forward step by step under the influence of the Spirit of God. One by one, these pioneers are passing away. The word given me is, let that which these men have written in the past be reproduced. 
Now, Ellen White was told by Jesus Christ, repeat what the pioneers were taught. Put their writings out again. Why did Jesus say that? Because he knew the leaders of this church were going to set them aside and teach new things. And the Trinity is just one of them. Now God is trying to save his church. And he will do it. <laughs> He's not going to fail. He is going to save people who are real Seventh-day Adventists. In the BRI article that deals with the King James Version, it says there are even some people in our church who are trying to bring back what the pioneers taught. I happen to be one of them. If they want me to feel like an idiot, they're going to be mistaken in that because I'm not going to feel like an idiot. I'm going to feel, Lord, they've made void your law. It's time for you to rise again. Well, I keep reading these things and our best scholars and I can't hardly <laughs> take reading them. And of course, anybody that disagrees with the elite is one of those ragged dummies down there and don't know anything. Well, when they deny J.N. Andrews, when he says we ought to be ashamed of ourselves, we ought to blush using those Catholic versions. That's what Jane Andrews says. You know what? I don't think they would baptize him today. I don't think so. They would not baptize Uriah Smith. They would not baptize Huskell. They would not baptize... I wonder who in the world they would baptize among the pioneers. These articles must be reproduced. There is truth and power in them. Men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, is she lying to us? Who are we going to listen to? We're going to have to make some decisions because the people in leadership today don't know any of this stuff. And if you say it to them, oh, you're one of those. You're one of those. You haven't learned. Ellen White gave it all up and she became one of us. Some will depart from the faith. She got that one right. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They talk science. What science? Well, I don't think evolution... That's what everybody gets told to put them off. The science of the higher critics. The science of the ones who say, well, we have 5,000 unsealed here. We have 2,000 minuscule here. We have against Erasmus and his mess. We're science. <laughs> He's a dummy. She just said it here. They talk science. And the enemy comes in and gives them an abundance of signs. And I don't know why people don't understand. Who are they listening to? Bruce Metzger? They all quote Bruce Metzger. He is a transgressor of the law. Our best men go to him to learn what truth is. Ellen White says, we are not the sea. <laughs> With their eyes, we are not to hear with their ears. We are not to think with their perverted senses. They're Babylon. Whatever happened to the second angel's message? When's the last time you heard anybody anywhere preach the second angel's message? You can't get to the second angel, to the third angel, if you don't have a second. We have lost the second angel's message. The second angel's message says, You, Sunday Keeper, are a transgressor of God's holy law. That's the second angel's message. Oh, but we wouldn't do that. That's, that's not kind. That's not sweet. 
All right, let me finish reading here. After the passing of time in 1844, we search for the truth as hidden treasure. Often we remain together until late at night and sometimes through the entire night praying and fasting and studying. How many people do that today? I think I could send out a questionnaire to all the scholars in this denomination and ask them, have you ever done that? The pioneers did. I would be taken off in vision and a clear explanation of the passages we have been studying would be given me from who? When we say we don't believe what the pioneers taught, we're saying we don't have the same God. It's really simple. They knew who their God was. A line of truth extending from that time to the time when we shall enter the city of God was made plain to me, and I gave to others the instruction the Lord had given me. We were in harmony. Oh! We are never going to know that again until we start believing the truth together. When everybody has their own opinion and they say, well, my opinion is as good as yours, we're going nowhere. We will not have unity until we listen to Jesus telling us the truth about who He is and who the Father is. And you're never going to hear Jesus say, there's somebody else out there too. You're never going to hear it. We shall have to meet these same false doctrines again. In the future, deception of every kind is to arise. In the future? Is that us? In our time, deception. And we want solid ground for our feet. We want solid pillars for the building. Not one pin is to be removed from that which the Lord has established. You want to know what the Lord established? Go read the 1872 Fundamental Principles because James White tells us all of them. This is what we all believe in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And if you can't say you believe those things, you better ask yourself, why? Why don't I believe what James White and the rest of them believed? You know, when Ellen White died, this church, up until that moment, all believed the same thing, except for a few rebels that hadn't raised their head yet. But as soon as she was dead, they raised those heads. Daniels, Prescott, I could list the names. And by the way, the, the BRI lists those names too, and it says they finally came to the light, and they, re, they believed Bible truth. Now, they had left what the pioneers used to believe. These are apostates. But they're the good guys. One of them, in discussing some of this, says, you know, it all depends on how you look at things. Is the glass half full or is it half empty? That's how they reason. In other words, it doesn't matter. It's just how you look at it. I'll give you some pages to look up. Volume 6 of the Testimonies, page 17. There is to be no change in the general features of our work. It is to stand clear and distinct as prophecy has made it. No line of truth that has made the Seventh-day Adventist people what they are is to be weakened. None of them believed in the Trinity before she died. None of them. She said we are not to weaken our positions. Don't change anything. Well, they did, just as soon as she died. 3MR413. A line of truth extending from that time to the time when we shall enter into the city of God was plainly marked out before me. So she was shown at the beginning of the Seventh-day Adventist movement, was shown to that group line by line by line by God. They didn't make it up. They didn't reason it out. They did what God told them. And she says what God showed us is going to stay true, clear, to the time we enter the city of God. So what do we get to change? 
We're supposed to believe what the pioneers believed. And when somebody says, I don't believe them, I believe the Bible, they don't believe the Bible either, I'm sorry. That's a lie. They do not believe the Bible because God showed the pioneers what the Bible means. The leading points of our faith as we hold them today were firmly established. Point after point was clearly defined. And all the brethren came into harmony. They all believed the same way. The whole company of believers were united in the truth. There were those who came in with strange doctrines, but we were never afraid to meet them. Our experience was wonderfully established by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. And you can go reading through her writings and she will tell you who that Holy Spirit is. It was Jesus. That's who they talked to. That's who instructed them. I handed this out. I better read a couple things out of it. The greatest gift. I want you to notice something here. The first one from youth instructor says, As yet, there is only a feeble partial faith in the hearts of the professed followers of Christ. That's Seventh-day Adventist. She says, we're feeble. In the Word of God, but we must learn what it means to live by, oh, here we go again, every word. <laughs> you see what the devil hates us? Who has this faith? Who, who of us believes with the simplicity of a little child that we may come to God through the name of Jesus? Now that's two people, isn't it? The Father and Jesus. And ask for spiritual food. Ask for the Holy Spirit, the greatest gift that heaven can bestow. And people say, see, there's a third one right there. I say, Wait a minute. I don't think people are reading correctly. It says here, the greatest gift. So let's find out what the greatest gift is. Then we'll know what the Holy Spirit is that she's talking about here. Let's read the next of Christ's object glasses. We can't read the whole thing. Let's read the lessons. They were afraid of being convinced. This is the leaders of the church. They were afraid of being convinced lest they should be converted and be compelled to give up their preconceived notions. The treasure of the gospel, the way. The truth and the life was among them. Who is that? Jesus. Can that be anybody else but Jesus? This is Jesus was among them. But they rejected the greatest gift that heaven can be shown. So what is the greatest gift that heaven can be shown? It's Jesus. He is the Holy Spirit. You can't have two greatest gifts. Now, you're either going to make Alan White some sort of a weird contortionist, or you're going to believe what she's saying. And if you don't believe the spirit of prophecy, you better stop studying this stuff. Because you're just increasing your own condemnation. Because God will not be trifled with. He says, I tried to get through to you and teach you the truth. But you chose to believe men and teachers. Instead of my spirit. Let's, let's read some more. In giving the Holy Spirit, it was impossible for God to give more. You mean when he gave Jesus, that was lesser? That's ridiculous. When God gave Jesus, he gave everything there is. So whatever the Holy Spirit is, it can't be more than Jesus. It can't be. Signs of the times, since God has given the greatest gift. In his power, he can't give any more. The greatest gift is the highest and the best that God can give. He has nothing else to give. We are to render to him our whole heart. He has poured out the world to the world the treasures of heaven, giving with such largeness that there is nothing more to bestow. What is the nothing more to bestow? Jesus! It's blasphemy to say God can give more than Jesus. 
Let's go to the next page. Signs of the Times, February 7th, 1878. He wants you to come into the position where he may grant you the gift of immortality. He has given you the gift of his son, the greatest gift that heaven could bestow. Now, I don't see any reason for being confused. God has just told us the greatest gift God can give is His Son, Jesus Christ. That's the greatest gift. And when He says He gives us the greatest gift He can give, the Holy Spirit, it's got to be His Son. The Holy Spirit is Jesus. Three manuscript releases, page 323. God's greatest gift is Christ. Now, Ellen White knew what she was saying. And she says it hundreds of times. I've just given you two little pages here. I don't know how our scholars have missed all of these. I don't think they want to see them. Great Controversy 477. The Father gave His Spirit without measure to His Son. And we also may partake of His fullness. I thought I had another in here. I didn't include it. Okay. Jesus says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Where did Jesus get the Holy Spirit from? His Father. The Father. Now, you see, this is another terrible bias that people have been taught by ministers and leaders. That Jesus didn't get anything from anybody. He always had it. But that's not what the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy say. The Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy say Jesus received the Spirit from the Father. He's the Son. So if Jesus got the Spirit from the Father, can we get it too? <laughs> that's what you just said. The Father gives His Spirit to Jesus without measure, and so it may be with us. Jesus gives us the Father's Spirit, but it's the same Spirit. You know, in one place, Ellen White says, memorize 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. I haven't told you about that one yet. Yeah, she said, memorize the 12th chapter and the 13th chapter. What's in the 12th chapter? It's talking about the Spirit. It says, the eye does not say to the foot, I don't need you. Of course you need each other. You have one body. And then he makes his application. He says, you have the gift of prophecy by the Spirit. You have the gift of government by the same Spirit. You have the gift of, by the same Spirit. You have the gift of, by the same Spirit. Every time there's a gift of the Spirit, it's always the same Spirit. Why? Because there's only one. It comes from the Father. And He gave it to Jesus. And between the two of them, the Bible says both. Both, both, that's what it says. Between the two of them, there is a third agency. There's the Father, the Son, and their spirit that they give to us. There are three agencies. There are three powers. There are three persons. There are three personalities. That's the Bible trying to tell us. There's the Father and the Son. And we get their spirit. What is it I get? I don't get somebody who's another God, because the Bible never says that. I get the mind of God. I get the influence of God. I get the, the thoughts of God. When Jesus said, my Father and I are one, what did he mean? Did he mean there was only one, one thing standing there? No. There were two. There's the Father and the Son. Two distinct beings. And by the way, you will never find the Spirit of Prophecy or the Bible saying there are three distinct beings. 
There are only two, the Father and the Son. The mind of God, the divine mind is what we get. You know that Ellen White says when we receive the Spirit of Christ, we receive power to live the life of Christ. That's why, because His Spirit in us does the same thing. When Jesus puts out His hands, what's happening? You take from His hands. His hands can never be empty. It's impossible. So as long as you keep reaching, there's always going to be something there. We have stopped reaching. But whose hands does it? Is it somebody that people are saying is a representative who, who it's not really him and somebody else? Come on. The Bible never says it's somebody else. It's always Jesus. God is. All right, this is what Webster says. God's ship. That's what Godhead meant back in the days of Ellen White. God's ship. What does God's ship mean? It means God. All the attributes of God. Omnipresence, omni, whatever. Deity. Divinity. Divine nature or essence. Applied to the true God. He hasn't missed anything. So now, if Jesus, uh, referring to the person, person means personality, is God the Father a personality? Yeah. Is He deity? Is He divine? Yeah. Okay, now here's the hard question. Who gave it to Him? Nobody gave it to him. That's who he is. Now I'm going to ask you a different question. Jesus is divine. Jesus is deity. Jesus is the very essence and nature of God. Who gave it to him? That's a different answer, isn't it? The Father gave all those things to him. That's why he's the Father. But you'll notice that the Father and Jesus are exactly the same nature. They both are divine. They both are deity. They both have all the attributes of God. But there's one thing Jesus can never be. The Father. Now any, any rational person should be able to see that. But if our biases keep getting in the way, it's not going to happen. Now I understand, please, let's all try to understand that no one can see this right away. It's not possible. Humans cannot understand this until they've wrestled with it for a while, until God has talked to them, until they start seeing things in the spirit of prophecy in the Bible they never saw before, until they start asking questions such as, how many people were involved in the creation? Was it three gods or was it two? You see, if we ask the question, then we can go looking for an answer. Let me show you very quickly what God says about it. Now, I am reading the Spirit of Prophecy. The sovereign of the universe. How many of those are there? Who is it? God the Father. The sovereign of the universe was not alone in his work of beneficence. He had an associate. How many is that? And means one. It doesn't say he had some. He had one associate. A co-worker. How many is A? Now, the, the BRI would have us believe that Ellen White gave this belief up. I want to know why we're still selling this book. She still believed it to her dying day. Continuing. Who would appreciate his purposes and could share his joy. They are one in nature, in character, in purpose. And Jesus is the only being that could enter into the counsels and purposes of God. The only being? You mean there's not another one that goes over there called the Holy Spirit? She said there's only one. 
So that means there were only two in those meetings, the father and the son. Nobody else ever. Now we're just reading the first page of Patriarchs and Prophets. It seems to me that every Seventh-day Adventist should have read this page at least. Continuing on this. The father wrought by his son in the creation. I don't know how many sermons I have heard where it was the son, the father, and the third God, the Holy Spirit. That's not in the Bible and it's not in the spirit prophecy. Somebody made that up and I know who did. You can go back to the Council of Nicaea and you see him doing it. Satan became jealous of who? Jesus. He didn't become jealous of the Father because he knew there's only one God. He can't take him on. There's only one God. But he has a son and he said that they're going to have proof. And so here's what Ellen White says. The coveting, he was coveting the glory with which the infinite father had invested his son, the prince of angels, aspired to power that was the prerogative of Christ alone. That word alone means there was nobody else, only Jesus, the father and Jesus. They're the only two that stood with the Godhead. But do you notice what it says the father did to his son? He invested him with glory. How do you invest somebody with glory if they already had it? Jesus did not have this until the Father gave it to him. To dispute the supremacy of the Son of God is page 35. Thus impeaching the wisdom and the love of the Creator had become the purpose of this Prince of Angels. To this object he was about to bend the energies of that mastermind which next to Christ was first among the hosts of God. So here's Jesus, the Son of God, and next to him after the Father and the Son, next to him is who? It does not say another God. It does not say Holy Spirit separate, distinct, all by himself. It says the very next one after the Father and the Son is Lucifer. Now these things have been in these books all the time. God won't let them take this stuff out. The Son of God shared the Father's throne and the glory of the eternal self-existent one encircled all three of them. Is that what it says? Encircled both. You're never going to find Ellen White say anything other than that word, both, the Father and the Son. Over and over she says, we must understand what the plan of salvation has cost them. Both. There's nobody else for it to cost. The Father and the Son, it costs them both. Now, we have just begun opening up the understanding of what Godhead means. This is a big question. Godhead means the Father, who alone has life without anybody giving it to Him. Jesus has been given that life, and now He can say, I have self-existent life. Where did he get it from? The Father! <laughs> self-existent doesn't mean he was always that way from all eternity because he always existed. No! He came into being as a personality, as a person from the Father. We must wrestle with this. I am not trying to convince anybody about anything. I just want you to see there's more to this than anybody is sharing with you. Get reading in the Bible and Spirit prophecy. And when you see something that somebody has told you means a third person, you better back up and say, well, if that's true, then why does it say over here there's only two? And you better find out why. There are good reasons. By the way, if you want to study, have you ever studied with a Methodist, a Baptist, a Nazarene, and you get their minds stirred up about the Sabbath, the state of the dead and all this, and they say, well, you know, I think, out of fairness to you, I'm going to study that. What are they going to study? 
<laughs> if they're a Baptist, they're going to read Baptist books to see if they can find them. If they're a Nazarene, they're going to read Nazarene books to see if they can find them. If they're... Now, what are they going to find? <laughs> they're only going to find what Baptists believe. They're only going to find what Nazarenes believe. And when a person in this church says, I'm going to study what the leadership has given me to study, what do you think they're going to find out? The only thing they're ever going to see is what the leaders want them to see. You better start reading the spirit of prophecy in the Bible for yourself. Because you're never going to get out of the ditch until you ask Jesus to show you personally. You yourself with him by his spirit, not by some made up one. The spirit of Jesus will teach you. He will show you, and when you get it from Him, no human is going to turn you around. I guarantee you, no human can do it. Because you will have made your connection to God Himself. That's the only reason I'm sharing some of these things, because there is a power that no one knows about until they get this one right. Let me read this one last thing as we close. John 17, 3. You know what it says. These are the words of Jesus. Well, we didn't get very far today. We just hit Godhead. <laughs> That's all we looked at so far. There's, I'll have to look at some of these other ones here. I'm sure there's some good comments there. Ah, uh, John. I better get to the Bible here. John 17, 3. This is life eternal. This. What Jesus is going to tell us. This is it. There's nothing else. This is the one. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. There's not three called the Trinity. There's only one. The only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. There's salvation. According to Jesus, when we give up the idea of a third God... And get to the Father and His Son. That's it. And now we will have the power of God in us. Because Colossians 1.27 says there's a mystery that we get. It will be open to us. And the truth will make you free. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Only Christ as the Savior and with Christ comes the Spirit of the Father but there's only the two of them Romans 8.32 He who gave us His Son will He not with Him give us all things only two only two that's enough don't you think alright just think about this statement when the Holy Spirit finally convinces me and shows me that all I need is the Father and Son. That's all I need for salvation. That's all there is. When I finally understand that, do you think I'm going to be unhappy? I really fear for people who get all upset because somebody took their Holy Spirit away from them that doesn't exist. Yeah. We, we have to be happy with the Father and the Son. That's the plan of salvation. <laughs> okay, we'll try to do more next time. Like I say, nobody gets this overnight. <laughs> this is very difficult. <laughs> All right, let's try. Father, help us to realize that when we say Father, that's who you are. You're the Father of Jesus first. And then you're our Father through Him. We thank you that you don't blame us because it takes us a while to work past the things we thought were true. We're just like that little piece of grass that you told us about. We're here and then we blow away. But in between, you're trying to teach us. You're trying to get us to understand you really mean what you say every time. And if we can just believe you and receive what you have for us, we will have the peace that passes all understanding. Jesus said, my peace I give you. He didn't say, I'm going to send somebody else with some. My peace, mine, 
I give it to you. Not as the world gives. I really give it to you. We're thankful that Jesus has spoken the truth to us. If we don't have the peace, help us to understand. It's because we're holding something back. And help us not to get angry, but help us to become humble and to become dependent and to say, thank you, Lord. You love me and you want to give me what you gave Jesus. We thank you in Jesus' holy name.